We are delighted to be welcoming Tony Adams to the Union Chamber this afternoon. With over 500 top flight appearances for Arsenal, Tony is the only football player to captain a side to the English title in three different decades. Widely considered one of the best centre-backs of all time, Tony has four league titles, three FA Cups and a place in the Football League's 100 Legends of the English Game to his name. All in the red and white of London's most successful club. 59 of his 66 England appearances came at the old Wembley Stadium, making him the player with the most appearances at Wembley of all time. His post-football career has taken him from Portsmouth to Granada and from Wickham to Azerbaijan, with stints as a TV pundit and president of the Rugby Football League in between. In 2000, Tony founded Sporting Chance, the first charity to provide mental health support for professional sports people. It is now the largest provider of education and treatment for sports professionals in the world. Folks, who please give a big hand for Mr. Arsenal himself, Tony Adams. Thank you. What a reception. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Lots of red shirts and yellow shirts. Very good. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to speak to us today, Tony. It really is an honour and a pleasure. So, we're going to talk a bit about your career and about what you're up to now, but I thought we'd take it all the way back to your childhood, born in Romford. Yeah. Was the plan always a career in football? And if so, was it always going to be in the red and white of Arsenal? Um, thank you, first and foremost, in inviting me along. And uh, I was just saying earlier that I, I, before lockdown, I tried to do five schools, five prisons. Um, and uh, I've, I've chalked off quite a few places, uh, the other mob, other university across the other way. Um, and uh, this was my last kind of chalked off. So it's really, really fun and delighted to be here. Was it always the case? I watched my dad when I was about five on Hackney Marshes. I got a bit cockney then, didn't I? I went, oh, a bit cockney. <laughs> I went, uh, um, yeah, and uh, he come from the east end of London and moved out to Dagenham born in Rod Romford Hospital, uh, and he was uh, a big centre-half, uh, quite a good standard. Um, uh, he had his kidney out uh, playing for the army um, and uh, was on the books at... Oh, that's damn! Sorry. Um, <laughs> and, but I always got the, you know, him is legendary six foot four, at the back, heading it, kicking it, even at that... That young age, I was kind of really obsessed with the, with football, and uh, I, and I just did everything, absolutely everything, um, to be a player. I used to jump into circle, crop circles or whatever they were, and go, "Oh, I want to be a player! I want to be a player!" Uh, but I, I did take some action as well, and I practiced, and I practiced every day. And uh, um, first, I went around all the clubs when I was about twelve or thirteen: Man United, Tottenham. Because um, you kind of get, when you're good at that level, you kind of, um, what's the word? You get uh, um, uh, scouted and uh, asked along for training. And um, Arsenal at that particular time had some tremendous coaches. You know, Terry Burton comes to mind, but we had Don L, probably the, one of the greatest coaches uh, this country uh, has ever produced and coached his country. And But I think he's a. Uh, um, uh, you know, that, that kind of um, learning period, my dad said to me, well, who's the best coaches? You know, and there was about 50 boys running around a hall at West Ham and uh, kind of one ex-player that was kind of going, don't know what to do. But at that moment, uh, it was the Arsenal. Arsenal had the, the best coaches uh, around. Um, and in 1979, uh, I signed, signed in the Lou. Uh, at Arsenal, but it was a, the, the scout that's just gone now, um, Steve Rowley had the best scouting system over the last 40 years and produced so many talents and I often say this, in the class of 92, I don't know if there's a film about the Man U boys, but we had a class of 82 
We had six internationals in our, in our youth team. We had Paul Mercer, Noel Quinn, myself, Martin Keogh, Michael Thomas, and my old mate Dave Rocastle. You know, six internationals, and that was the basis of, uh, of 89, winning, winning in 89, and the squad of 91. That was, there's two ways you recruit players. I'll get there, and I'll let you have some questions, Shasha, <laughs> but I just get talking about football, and it Go just kind of goes, Go doesn't it? it? Um, yeah, th there's two ways you recruit. You, you buy players in, or you produce them through your academy, to be honest with you, and, and we've had pretty much two dominant phases in the Arsenal history. One was based on that, that recruitment of 82. And, uh, and the other was uh, um, when Daniel Visman came in, he's a diamond dealer, and invested 50 million into the club in 95, 96 season. And all of a sudden we had Birdcamp turned up and Vieira and Nilka and, and all these other players. And that's the Invincibles, that was the two doubles in 90, 98 and 2002. Came a little bit from a financial perspective, but we still had the base of the old boys at the club as well. So back to Steve Rowley and the scouting system at Arsenal Football Club. Uh, and I went in there and it was his first day in the job, 1979. So I rocked up at Highbury Stadium. I got on a train Monday and a Thursday night, but this is the first ever time I, I turned up and I walked through on that Monday night and I walked into the, there was a Herbert Chapman, who big success with Arsenal Football Club in the 30s. Um, Walked into the into the stadium and um, when it said, "Oh, we're at Steve Rowley, who was the Arsenal scout," I said, um, uh, "Steve Stale, Steve Rowley sent me to to come and have a trial, have a have a workout." And uh, the, the the youth team coach at the time, a guy called Tommy Coleman, who's passed away now. Um, said, oh, I don't know, no, Steve Rowley, because it's Steve Rowley's kind of first week in the job. <laughs> he didn't know him, so me and dad looked at each other and we went, come on, let's go, not, we're not wanted. So we've turned around and we're walking back out of the Marble Hall, we had an Arsenal hybrid, that was my home. Um, and he went, oh, whoa, 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 why are you here? Why don't you have a, have a go and uh, have, a, have a training session? And I had a training session and the rest is history. So it was that close from not being the red and white of, uh, of London. But um, yeah, I'll let you have another question. Oh, please do. Well, <laughs> no, thank you. No, take the time you need. It's fascinating. Um, so you made your debut at 17. Mm. And before the age of 20, you became a first team regular. Yeah. What was that like? What was that like to be well, playing in the top division of English football at such a young age? I've got a... I've got a I've got to trace it back because part of that learning process had to be a footballer. My, my education was neglected. And, and I, I, was, I was a young kid that I couldn't do this for a start. I couldn't open my mouth. I was, excuse my language, but I was shit scared, you know, as a kid. Full of fear, you know, panic attacks at an early age. I always remember uh, the book going round in the classroom. And, it's kind of, and it's kind of, I'm having a, my first ever panic attack. You know, I didn't know this at the time. And as it's come to me... It's like, oh, no, no, reading lesson, oh. And he come to me and I said, wheelie, instead of really. And everyone laughed and laughed at me. And, oh, oh. and it, I was so sensitive and I was so full of fear and, and I just run to the football pitch, you know. I, I'm no good at that, but I'm great at that, you know. So I was like, Tony the footballer and not Tony the human being. You know, for my development as a human being was completely suppressed in football. It was my first, we call it, we call it, a, um, I suppose, passion. We call it drive. We call it determination when it's healthy. But we call it obsession. We call it addiction when we're, when we're kind of cross the line, you know. And, but at that young age, it was a, it, it, my football career was getting kind of uh, um, pushed on because I was so scared of the classroom. You know, I was living in my head and I didn't like that, them thoughts and I didn't like them feelings, you know, and the pressure of doing homework and all that, it just filled me with dread. So I didn't do it, I ran off. I had the worst attendance of my school. I'm not proud of that, but I just couldn't physically get through the fear. And I didn't have a family where I could go to my dad or my mum and go, oh, I think I'm having a real, oh, God, Jesus, I've, I've had a panic attack at school. My dad was on the docks at 12. He would have gone, what the f are you talking about, son? Go and hit someone, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wasn't, they, I don't blame them for that. They just didn't, didn't have no tools and they, and they taught me 
at a very early age how to suppress mm. thoughts and feelings. You know, that's what they did. They su- I suppressed everything, all those thoughts and feelings in, in football. It was my first drug of choice. So you talk about 17 playing a place. That's my comfy place. Mm. It was my place that I loved, you know. I was so cocky, I was so arrogant. Well, that's confidence. I suppose it's <laughs> arrogant when you get carried away and cross the line again. You know, there's a, there's a difference in there. And I just kind of went onto the football pitch and it, I was about, off the pitch. Ugh! Mm. Now, that was the stuff. I was, you know, I did, my first girlfriend was in my head. You know, <laughs> her name was Juicy Lucy. And you know, all my mates having, having girlfriends, I couldn't do that. You know, I couldn't do that. I couldn't physically talk to anybody. So none of the opposite sex. You know, I was like, oh my God. So the first time I experienced alcohol, alcohol was part of my, 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 is my journey as well, is when I couldn't play football. Mm. And I broke a, my fifth metatarsal in my, in my foot when I, was, uh, um, when I was 17. I'd played the three games for Arsenal, made my debut, everything's going to clockwork, absolutely love. Tony, what happened for me, my... Tony Adams, the the ego was going up here. I was getting pats on the back for what I was doing and not who I was. And my self-esteem and my self-worth was coming down all the time. Coming down, down, down. So, on a football pitch... Do you want to ask another question? No, carry on. (laughs) Carry on. It's fascinating. I'm going off piece after what you said, actually. This is is really interesting stuff, so please carry on. Perfect. So, yeah, I I just uh, um, made my debut... And um, the first time I've experienced alcohol is when I couldn't play football. Um, and like my football career, I tried to, to, I tried to, it's about winning and losing for me and trying to be, I never liked the taste, that's the insanity. You know, never liked the taste, loved the effect. You know, I felt, you know, I felt ugly, quite a handsome guy now. No, no, no. <laughs> but I, I just felt I had big ears, I was awkward, six foot three in the classroom. Just felt so horrible. I had that stuff. My God, I turned into, I think, who did you have here recently? Richard Gere or whatever. De Niro. De Niro. I felt, I felt like Richard De Niro. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> I'm a superstar. I'm a gangster. I'm a this, I'm a that. You know, it's like... Turned to me, I felt all those insecurities just went out the door, and that was from the first ever pint of shandy, <laughs> you know, because I didn't like the taste, so I had to work on it. The shandy, lager tops, come on, come on, because I wanted the effect, I wanted oblivion. My story is not a glass of wine with your girlfriend at dinner, you know, it's not a couple of beers with your mate Sunday lunchtime. It, that's not my story. My story is to oblivion. You know, and very quickly, I was having episodes. I always wet myself, wet myself after wet myself. My mother used to dry the bed, you know. She, was, she didn't understand. I don't, you know, blame her for that. She, but, so my football career, my drinking career, run side by side. And the more stuff, the uh, more successful I was becoming, the kind of accepting my behaviour off the pitch was becoming. You know, people kind of went, well, you know, you're doing really well. You're doing really well. You won't talk about the weighing yourself and the sleeping with people you didn't want to sleep with and the, and the falling over and the blackouts and the intensive care and the prison. And it, we won't talk about all that. We'll talk about 89. That was fantastic, you know? That was the great stuff. But like I say, that's great. But then when you go on a three-week bender afterwards, you know, actually, where is that about, you know? So in my early days, it was all... Uh, um, my, my addiction was, was carried out when I was injured or uh, uh, holiday periods, you know, summer periods. I went, I'd be far, me all cut, you know, all the places where I could get smashed and out my head, really, you know. And uh, I, I surrounded my people. My mum always used to say, I think I said it earlier, you know, show me your friends and I'll show you you. And I had drug dealers and, <laughs> and you know, and, and, and publicans were my pals, you know what I mean? It's, and I always was chasing that, that, that first little bit when I had a first couple of drinks and it just took the edge off of life. And if I, if I could still do, if I could do it, I would be, I'd be still doing it, but that's not my story, you know. I remember going into a pub once and, and kind of looking in the mirror and I'd had a couple, just a few, and kind of went, oh, just please, 
just stay like this, stay like this. This is that artificial eye of, of what I experienced in football, to be honest with you. So I will fast forward a little bit. I'm sorry that I've not, not come here, because it, uh, but I'm going to keep talking. Uh, <laughs> but so my football career and my, my drinking career went side by side. I think it's important that you hear this stuff. Um, and we were becoming a very good cup team. After we won the league in 91, we never won the league again until I sobered up in 98. And um, there's a Tottenham fan just going out the door there. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I should have done that. That's shaming people. It's sorry. encouraged, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, so where was I? 90... 96. 98. 98, 98. Uh, we didn't win the league again until 98. Yeah. So we had five years where the captain of the club, he's, he's kind of, I was in prison, Chelmsford Prison, like I told you, I put my, in 92, I put 29 stitches in my head, I nearly checked out of here. You know, I was in blackouts, blackouts after blackouts. And, you know, the, 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 the horrific, if anyone's experienced blackouts here, it, it, it's, uh, um, you know, phoning up the next day, what I do, what I do? And that, that kind of, my solution was to go and get smashed again. <laughs> That's the illness. That's the sickness of, the, of this illness. So we became, Arsenal became a very good cup team and, and I really let down England as well. You, you, think, you think of this. You know, we won the league in 89 and we won the league in 91 at Arsenal. And I was playing for England and we went to England once the World Cup in 1990. And you didn't take the captain of the title-winning team that won the league in 89 and 91. Something's got to be going on there, isn't it? It's like Harry Kane now. You wouldn't take Harry Kane to the next tournament. You know, what, what's all that about? And, and I put it down, to be honest with you, with my behaviour. You know, I've got to say, at that part of 99, so I've been drinking for, for 16 years at that point, you know, and it, the illness was, was getting to me. I would rather sit in the pub on my international break period, when you've got two games for England to go away, I'd rather sit in the pub and get smashed out of my head than go and play for my country. That's where the illness took me. You know, that's where, you know, it's, it's not... Who doesn't want to go and play for their country, you know? There's the fear of that. I know I had a Scottish manager at the time as well. <laughs> he didn't want me playing for England. But so... so um, the year of 95, 96 for me, and it became, like I said, Arsenal became a good cup team. I could get up for certain games, cup competitions, six games in to win a cup competition, where to win the league, you've got to play 42 games. So I couldn't go out on a Saturday night and then play midweek, for instance. You know, that was becoming a real street because I was having, getting smashed after games, getting smashed all day uh, Sunday, going into training on Monday, running around, oh, 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 trying to get a bit under, going out Monday night, darts, clubs, eight pints of lager, Tuesday, Tuesday club, we're off Wednesday, so I can get smashed all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday. Thursday, snooker, eight pints of Guinness. You know, at the end of my drink, I'm basically sobering up on a Friday to play Saturday, you know. So it was really taking its coals, and the consequences were adding up. This after this after this, you know, the we in the intensive care, the, the fights, the this, the that, you know. The sickness was getting more and more intense, escalating my illness. And then it came to... to uh, um, 96, where I was spending a lot of tubs, time in pubs and clubs, so I married a barmaid. Um, her drug of choice was cocaine. What she did for me, <coughs> cocaine at the start, went on to crack cocaine very quickly over about a three-year period. Um, what she did for me, she propped me up. At least I'm not as bad as you. I found, I found that in football as well. You know, playing with Martin Keown was great because he's shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it, just, it just makes you... Sorry, Martin. He went, no, he's Oxford boy. We don't like him. Anymore. <laughs> but do you, know, do you know what I mean? So I did it in my personal life. I've got a wife there that I don't communicate with. We never spoke to each other in six years that we did, you know. It was a really... I was scared of it, to be honest with you, at times when some of the stuff she, she was doing, you know, it was volatile. Um, but what she did, I, I'm not, I'm, I just drink alcohol, I just sleep, I was the one that was unfaithful, I was the one in prison, <laughs> but because I don't do, I don't do crack, I'm better than you, I'm better than you, so I put her into treatment, <laughs> I drove her down drunk, put her into a, a rehab down in Somerset, 
sort your life out, drug. He threw her in there. And two counsellors said, oh, how are you, Mr. Adams? I, me? I, we will do some football stuff, I oh, promise so you. No, this is fantastic. Get this Thank out you so way, much. Mate. Thank you okay. so much for, for, for sharing, honestly. Uh, um, and these two said, how are you, Mr. Adams? And I went, what do you mean? You know, fueled with ego and arrogance. I went, excuse me, fuck off, I'm England captain. Sort her out. You know, she, I've got three kids with this woman. You know, sort her out. She's in here. She, get her sorted out. And I drove home, but a little twist. January 96 just kind of went, ooh, ooh. Something might be up here. After 11 and a half years of drinking, just had a little bit of a twitch. Ooh, ooh. Might be, might be me. In the February, uh, the cartilage, dangled my leg. John Artson, big Welsh international in training. I dangled my leg, took my cartilage out so I can't get football because I'd used football to abstain from alcohol and drugs. Okay, so I needed that to be removed. In the March, my mother-in-law comes round. At this point, my wife is two months clean and sober and says she's not coming home. Coming home to me. I'm super father, I'm super husband. Why are you not coming out to me? You... <laughs> but there was a rejection there. So I've had a little bit of rejection, a little bit of these counsellors calling me out. Football stopped, got to look at myself. I pass out one Sunday afternoon, I've done seven bottles of Chablis. Pass out, my mother-in-law slaps me around the face, you drunken bastard, takes the kids away. So I ain't got no responsibilities whatsoever. She did put a, a number in my pocket. So my, I get emotional a couple of times during this story and one of it's around this. She put a number in my, in my pocket of a psychotherapist and <sighs> saved my life. You know, saved my life, but not at that moment. Um, and she uh, um, took the kids and it was the first time, I think, in 11 and a half years of drinking that I actually didn't want to drink anymore. I didn't want to drink anymore, but I was still getting pissed. You know, I think that's the real difference between the problem drinker and the alcoholic. Um, for me, uh, that, given that situation when you've had prison, you've had intensive care, you're weeing yourself, your wife's gone, the kids have gone, you're lying in the gutter, basically. My sofa was, was my park bench. Uh, you kind of go, mm, I might need some help here. I might have to have a look at this. I think what I thought, my thoughts were, party. I've got no responsibility. Let's go and get shit-faced again. <laughs> but there's this kind of conflict now when I knew where it was taking me. So I'm white-knuckled. I white-knuckled through the Euros in 96. Uh, I went to Hong Kong with the team before the championships and I've got this mask. Don't forget, you know, I'm telling this story now with, with, with a... 25 years of not drinking and drugging and a little bit of consciousness. But at that time, if you asked me, I was like, yeah, good, yeah, right, yeah, come on, let's do them, let's hit them. I was a, I was a bully, really. You know, I, I ruled, I was a captain that, that are, um, it's my way or the highway, you know, come on board. Get success. I always say, you know, Man United are my charity. We get more people come through from old school kind of management than we do <laughs> with uh, Arsene Wenger's and we'll come on to that a bit later on. So it was, it was my, you know, I, I, I had this image and I had this mask and I'm great, I'm good, I'm this, I'm that. But un underneath I was kind of... I'd abstained from alcohol um, from the before, uh, using football. Uh, but as soon as Gareth missed the penalty... There used to be, would you believe that, that Wembley Stadium that I played more than any other? We used to have a bar in the corner, would you believe? <laughs> it, it doubled up. In the, in, before the game, you used to get your tabs and stuff to tie your socks up. And, but after the game, it set up as a little bar and there was a Carlin Black label that the guy, he's passed away as well. He gave me this Carlin Black label after the game. And I went on an almighty six-week bender and did all the stuff, slept with people that I didn't want to sleep with, you know, blackouts, weed me, set, all that kind of stuff, all that mayhem. And I got to Friday, the 16th of August, 1996, and I wanted out. And it was just too painful. I just didn't want to be on this planet anymore. It was just, you know, and 
if you are affected by this, guys, we've got places where you can go and you can talk to, and I'm sure you'll look after that uh, later on. But I got to the place where I was sitting there with me pint of Guinness. At that stage, because I didn't like the taste, uh, brandy used to make me sick, so I used to put it in the Guinness to keep it down. So I got a pint of Guinness with the brandy in, 5 o'clock, 16th of August, and it was there, and I'm like... <sighs> I've got no life here, you know, I just, I just wanted out. I wasn't, I hadn't reported back for training. Do you imagine that as well? Harry Kane or, or even anybody, a bang yang, doesn't turn up on the first day of pre-season training. You know, June, July the 1st, when we all used to go back. Turn it, the captain's gone missing. The physio was trying to find me for five weeks. It's August the 16th now. <laughs> you know, where is he gone? You know, it would be done there, the social media and stuff. <laughs> You'd instantly find me. But I, I was missing. I went missing. And I just got there. And what I did, I started to cry. And I was 29 years of age. And I started to cry. And the tears were just coming down and down and down. And I just felt a release, a surrender. I gave up. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I just threw the towel in. I didn't know how to keep, you know, be sober. I didn't know anything about the illness of addiction. But I did have a spiritual moment, call it what you want, moment of clarity that completely lift, lifted the compulsion to drink out of me. Just by that, just kind of that, I'm fucked. I'm done. I can't do it. Please show me the way. You know, and I went to my first AA meeting that Friday and I've not had a drink since. And uh, it's been an incredible, incredible journey. I got my career back and I think I needed to do that because I've got to tell you guys about this losing your mojo shit. It, I became a better person. I became a better player. In my last six years I had playing clean and sober. First of all, Physically, it came back because I'm not consuming the amount of alcohol <laughs> that I was consuming. But the mental stuff, you know, the reason why I drank in the first place, because I realised that the illness is in me and it's not in the bottle. You know, it's my issues, all those stuff that I said about reading the book, all those panic attacks, all those insecurities. There's a reason why I drank. You know, it wasn't <laughs> the, 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 the actual substance. You know, so I needed to look at that and I needed to look at that and thoughts and feelings. That's what I need to look after, and I still do on a daily basis. But when I went back into football, obviously it was floating around, so I went meetings after meetings. I went to see that guy that my mother-in-law put in my pocket, and uh, I still see him today, 25 years down the road, I'm speaking to the same guy. He's 77 now, bless him. And uh, it's my safe place. It's my, you know, because I've never had it from my family, I've never had it from my friends. Uh, but he gets the lot, he gets the lot, and he goes, me too. So I think it's important to hear that I was more successful than I was ever was. I did two more doubles, you know, I played free, and you don't get a statue outside. You didn't mention that, did you? I mean, bad. bad. That, was my, that, was, that was my final question, actually, <laughs> Tony, but that's all right, we'll get to it. But you don't get a statue if I didn't clean up. And actually, I, it's, it, like I said, I wanted out, so... You don't, you know, you go to a funeral, you don't go to a, you know, and I'm very proud that the, the statue's up there and I was able to play free and decide, you know, when to retire and when not to retire and subsequently my life's been brilliant since. I'll let you have a question. No, no, honestly, thank <laughs> you so much. It is, it's truly an inspirational story to hear. And as we were talking before the interview about, you know, how the world of professional sports people and the world of students at universities are obviously very different. Mm. But uh, mental health, addiction, these are things that, that we all deal with. And uh, yeah, to hear it from someone like yourself is, is very powerful. I think my main question of, after that story is, is when this was going on, mm. was, was the club supporting you? Was the club aware of the extent of, of the problem? I think we're a little bit more informed today, yeah. hopefully. Um, the awareness is there. I'm not so sure about the backup services. You know, I think the... We are starting to speak about this stuff, hallelujah, especially us guys, come on guys, you know, 18 a day are committing suicide, we need to fucking start talking about that stuff. But we also need the backup services, the safe places like I had, you know, we need those support services, it's so important. So back in the day, 
you know, in the early 90s. I don't think anyone was born that's, that's actually on this screen. <laughs> but I, I think, uh, um, you know, I was, I was publicly ridiculed for, for because it, it was very uncomfortable for a lot of people because they had me in a certain box <coughs> and they had me as a certain type of human being. And I, I got out of that box and I started to go, actually, no, no, actually there's a strength in my weaknesses. You know, there's a real strength in, in, in telling people you're vulnerable and, you, and you're scared. And there's a real, real strength in that. And I became a different captain. And, I, and I'll give you one example where I changed over that period. And it's a bit corny, but when the pupil's ready, the teacher appears. And, and if you're open then they, and you can spot it, hallelujah. And six weeks into my sober career, um, Arsene Wenger uh, went through, came through the door and Arsene was uh, um, uh, he, he learnt a lot about the illness through his parents who uh, owned a pub in Strasbourg and he saw how alcohol changed people. Uh, so he had a little bit of, a, of an understanding of, of, of alcohol, maybe not of addiction, but then again, he maybe was an addict himself. <laughs> Characteristics of an addict is not le- being able to let go. <laughs> and I think there's a part of him at the end of his career. Anyway, at that particular time when he was, <laughs> when I was six weeks clean and sober, I needed a human being that was, was of, a, uh, of an open and a spiritual mentality. You know, I needed someone that, that could converse and I had a cup of tea with him every morning and, it, and it, was, it was just beautiful. It was really beautiful. And the example that I'm going to give you is, is uh, um, a, a guy called Ian Wright. He's, he's on the media at the moment. You're probably all aware of Wrighty. And uh, um, he's, uh, he's coming round the motorway um, from Croydon, where he used to live, and, and we used to train in, in North London, uh, on the Greater London, really, St Albans Way. Um, and uh, I, I'll say this carefully, because he phoned me, because I, I did a, I'd done this story before in the uh, outside domain, and, and uh, um, he phoned me up and said, oh, I wasn't late every day, it, I wasn't late every day. He was, sometimes he was late because he was coming round, okay? So that's that taken off with writing. Um, but my reaction pre me opening up <coughs> um, was to be, maybe to get him and say, get in on time, come on, get in on time. You know, I'd, I'd probably bully him, to be honest with you. I'd probably say, right, get in, you yeah, yeah. conflict and all that kind of... Uh, and now I'm in a position where I kind of talk about stuff. So I go to Arsene, I say, no, Arsene, we've got a real problem here. You know, what, what are we going to do? So that's revolutionary for a start, you know, because I would have added up against a brick wall straight away and sorted it out. So you're actually talking with another human being about a situation and you get a different perspective. And he said, oh, this is my Arsene Wenger in, uh, <laughs> into... Oh, Tony. <laughs> no, that sounds a bit George Graham, doesn't it? No, no, Tony. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we changed training time. We put training time back so we can get in. What? What? No, we need to get on. We need to get him in, you know? What, what are you... Training time? Yes. So we used to start training 10 o'clock. He's proposed, Arts and Binger, to put it back to 11. I'm like... What's that about, you know? He said, we need him, don't we? We need Wrighty at the moment. And yeah. And he can get in on time and we all train together. It... <sighs> yeah, but I'm not happy with it, but okay. He gets in on time and we win the double that year and Wrighty contributes. It's another solution. Less painful, it's not aggressive, it's not confrontational, it's not... I just t- was taught a different way into maybe handling situations that were more mentally healthy, you know, and not have all the kind of fallout of the, ah, ah, go down the pub and get smashed with him and get bombed, or so, you know what I mean? And all that kind of craziness. I thought, just by talking about things, that I could do things differently. Mm. And that's a, maybe an example. One, one last question for me before I open up to the audience. I think you mentioned earlier about how things have improved. Uh, in the realm of, of mental health for, for sports people, for, for men in general, and I think you're being quite humble 
uh, to be totally okay. honest with you, because I think that your charity, Sporting Chance, which you set up in 2000, still playing, has, has had a major effect on that. Mm. Um, Thank you. And for, for those of you that, that don't know about, about Tony's charity, it's, it's well, why am, I, <laughs> why am I explaining it? If you could explain okay, what, uh, what you well, do. Uh, all right. Um, well, as I kind of said, I was a bit of a trailblazer. I, I got ridiculed. A guy called Paul Howard, uh, Hayward of the Telegraph, I think it was, maybe the Observer then, did a piece like he's away with the theories. They thought I was away with the theories, you know, because I was being open and honest with people and, 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 and getting my stuff out there and sometimes that, that hurts and they, some people were not ready for that and they certainly weren't ready. He's, he's made amends, he said sorry to me, I accepted it and we move on in life but that period, you know, they just thought I was a bit kind of crazy. I'd seen the light, I'd seen God or something, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, oh, oh. Um, so it has changed, hallelujah, uh, and people are more and more out there. And we've got a prince, Prince William now, is doing an incredible job, and he came down to my charity in 2014. But I was getting a lot of people privately, sports people, coming up to me. I'm about two years, three years clean and sober, saying, oh, Tom, how did you, you know, I've got, I've got a few issues going on at the moment. Help, how did you, who do you speak to? So I quickly put my man in place and made him clinical director of, of the charity, uh, in your rightly, in 2000. And uh, I think that the, it is the biggest. We like to think we're the best. We've got four services. We've got education. Front, this is what I'm doing today, really. That, that, that kind of side of it is the prevention rather than cure, making the awareness stuff, talking about all this stuff, which is great. And then we've got the backup services of the helpline, of the 24-hour helpline, and the network of counsellors that are specialists to, to deal with all this stuff, and a, an addiction recovery services as well. And uh, I started that with sport. I now run a business that does the same. I've also got six addiction trusts that actually puts people through and uses the addiction services as well. Because what I found during lockdown, I've developed this fantastic, unique situation within sport. We've got 16 um, organisations, squash, snooker, darts, rugby league, football, blah, 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 blah. And uh, um, I kind of hit a ceiling with it. And I've kind of do, we, get, we did 1,000 athletes into 2019. And, but now I've got people outside of the sports world coming to me and going, help. And I went, well, actually, right. I, and I couldn't use Sporting Chance because I, I specifically made it a sports charity with the uh, Charity Commission. So I opened up another for everybody else now. So um, that's what I do in the meantime. Um, I think that's answered your question, yeah. isn't it? Fantastic. Well, it's, it's amazing work you do, Tony. Thank you very much. I'm just going to open it up to the floor. If anyone has any questions, pop your hand up and then we'll get a microphone to you. That hand at the front, in the scarf, shot straight up. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. That was a very inspiring speech. Um, my question is in the context of captaincy, um, especially given Arsenal's struggles in recent years or decades to find a replacement as a leader, an on-field captain. Um, you, you mentioned you changed the captain once you became sober. Yeah. Um, and, but I think from the outside, a lot of people would still consider you a very successful captain before that point in terms of on-field. But do you think it's possible to separate, especially in today's environment, on-field leadership with um, discipline and commitment off the pitch? Um, I think I'll give you the examples of, of how I changed as a person, as a captain. I think I had fundamental qualities for a start. I've always been... Um, uh, in certain settings, confident of what I do. And that was the conflict with the human being. And my therapist always used to say to me, Tony, you got one part of your life right. You know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. You know, just ripple it through your private life, what you used to do. And there was a lot of good qualities I had to lead in Arsenal, as you well said, you know, when I was first made captain in 87. You know, Christmas 86 when Kenny Samson was there, it felt really normal for me to take the lead. You know, I was the one that was um, physically, I suppose, first and foremost, being the person that would, you know, if you see a fight there, a lot of people run that way. 
I'm going to be the one that's running towards it. You know, that's just in my, in my nature. But there's a certain amount of learning mentally and emotionally that I didn't grow up. I was a better captain, I think you'll find, mentally and emotionally, but because I, I knew the human condition a little bit more. So how I was getting to know me, I could understand other people when it was the right timing because we had people from around the world come into that, that dressing room and it was a different dressing room to the, to the 17 players we used to win the league in 89. You know, it was a different game, a different ball game and a different, different, uh, um, different place. But um, I don't know if that's answered your question. I, I, I found myself being a, a very uh, different captain but the football part of it I've got to tell you it, it's it was what I was good at and what I was confident at so that really didn't really change you know it was the off the field stuff really that changed around the world you know it, it went free 360 and you know, and at the time, the game changed as well alongside that, you know, physically, nutrition and everything else. It was calling out, you know, a lot of the foreign players that come over, they couldn't believe, you know, Arsenal, I had a conversation with Arsenal once about her having a, a, a training camp. I said, uh, oh, he said, oh, well, that's a good idea. Oh, we go, we go, we, we, we go to Germany. We have a training camp, we, we train twice a day. So, no, 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 no. 1987, we go three times to Marbella because the coach um, gets divorced and he likes the girls around in Marbella. And we don't take no balls. <laughs> you might have a game of golf, but basically you get smashed for a week. That's it. You get drunk for a week. You know, what kind of culture were we living in, you know? But, like, I was at the front of the queue for that you know, getting them all smashed, you know, I wanted to be the best drinker and I was, turned out to be the worst drinker, <laughs> you know what I mean? But then you kind of game change, I change, and it was kind of right time and the, the right things and the normal people, 90% of the population kind of changed with it, you know, that kind of was, was fed, I got my, I was, got my mates divorced, you know, I got them all kind of, they, they, when I sobered up and I got the whole of the dressing room there and I went, Guys, I've a real bloody issue with this, and, I, and I'm going to AA. I've got a therapist, and I'm, I'm going to try it. They went, oh, hallelujah. You know, we've been telling you that for the last six years, you know. I was, I was killing them all, you know, dragging them all down. I wanted sick people around me. And then when I got sober, I wanted well people around me. You know, I didn't tolerate the, 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 the sickness, you know, I didn't tolerate the sickness anymore. So the game changed, I changed. It was, it was kind of the perfect timing. I don't know if I've answered it. I think I might have done. Excellent question. Thank you very much. Just this gentleman in the front row. There, you. <laughs> Hi, so um, two questions. One, I've been intrigued what you said to Gareth Southgate after you missed the penalty in 96 because it clearly turned me around. <laughs> and secondly, I mean, I... Uh, remember watching you as a teenager admiring your leadership and your skill and I feel almost embarrassed that I had no idea everything that was going on I mean part of that is careful marketing and control and everything else um, and yeah then I've admired footballers but now I've got kids I'm thinking to myself what do I want them to aspire to be when they're older and yeah you had success that's the envy of most men in the world but like you said, it came at the compromise of your education, of your mental health, of your own self-identity because you were, like you said, praised for what you achieved and nothing else. My question to you is, you know, for me, talking to my children, do you, would you recommend that I encourage them to aspire to elite sport or would you say actually stay away from it? It's <laughs> not good for your well-being. I don't, I don't regret one little bit of, of what I did and, and sport. I'm, I'm here today because I kicked the ball about end of the day, not because my mental, <laughs> mental health's a condition, you know. So I, I, I think there's better education in sport than there's ever been. I think we've got different issues today, but we've still got issues. 
Um, and we've, but we've got organisations like my charity. There was nothing there, you know, 96 to 2000. There was nothing there, you know. You're on your own. You know, work it out for yourself, you know. But there is organisations there, and Sporting Chance is one of them. If, if they're an athlete in there, they can reach out. And I won't give you names, but there's a certain amount of high-pro professionals that have lent on our services and they're, and they're top of their industry and they've not had a fallout like I've had to. You know, they've got them before they've gone in. They're mentally, emotionally well before they even hit the heights of their profession. So I wouldn't discuss... I've got six kids and two grandchildren and it's not, you know, I wouldn't, if they want to be a professional footballer, then knock yourself out. But I will teach them about life as well and about handling your, your after the game and, and before the game. Because don't forget, I... I had that experience. I had that clean and sober with good mental health, playing, it, playing at the top of my profession, at my top of my industry, lifting titles, you know, at the top, at the very top. So I, it can be done. And there is athletes out there that can do it. So I want to discourage them for one minute to, to any industry, to go into any, just to be the best person you can be, to be honest with you. That's all I want my kids to be, you know. And if they're a barrister or they're a, a construction worker, it don't really matter for me. It's just like all those thoughts and feelings is, is what I deal with today, life. And, and if they're a kind of, we're all trying to do our bit here, aren't we? We, we all kind of put in one foot in front of the other. You know, you look at Ukraine at the moment, and I had to bring it up. Sorry about that, but one customer, one client that I'm dealing with at the moment, has got 714 people in, in in the Ukraine, and and you know we're talking about putting some trauma uh, therapy around them, you know, because war therapy trauma is completely different to the to the stuff that we're handling on a, on a daily basis. But it's still our stuff. I don't undervalue it because it's what we've got to go on today. Whether you've got an exam at the end of the week or what have I got going on? I've got nothing really. Playing golf tomorrow. <laughs> Playing golf, he's going to stress me out tomorrow if I don't win. Come on! So we've all got our stuff, and, and it's the tools and signposts and safe places. That's what I say to my kids. If they're if they're talking, and, and, I, and I said it earlier, show me your friends, and I'll show you you. And 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 there's only a bit of own work here. We're in the right environment, and it's the only thing I asked. Even if you think I'm I'm a pile of poo, and I've I actually I've been talking absolute shit today, I don't really care. What I want you to do is go and talk to another person about what we've been talking about today, OK? Buddy up with someone, someone you've not spoke to for a while or whatever, just a mate said, oh, I was, I was Tony Adams coming and talk at you, and he was talking about mental health and, and what's your safe places and who do you go to when you're having a bad day and that kind of stuff. Just have a chat, have a coffee with someone and, 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 and talk about this stuff. The more we can do, uh, the better. Buddy up. Thank you so much. I think we've got some, just a couple more questions. Uh, saw your hand go straight up at the front there. First of all, thanks for your talk, obviously. Um, I um, was just wondering, how big of a problem do you think that, like, maybe from your experiences and also through your charity work, what you've seen, how big of a problem masculinity is in kind of addressing problems that you've got and, yeah, issues yeah. with addiction and that sort of thing? Yeah, there's a gambling um, Epidemic in, in, in football, and, and I think one in two suicides now are gambling related, and, and the addictions not being not being addressed, and, and men are still killing themselves. Thirteen men and five women, and I think the construction industry in particular um, are three times more likely to commit suicide. It's guys that are may, maybe less educated emotionally or mentally, uh, and they're physically got in their forties and fifties, and what lost all hope. And in particular, girls, young girls, self-esteem issues, um, self-worth issues, younger age, you know, comparing, we always say compare and despair, you know, social media, this type of stuff. It's had a huge effect on suicide deaths in, in, in young girls. So these are the issues that we're starting to talk about, hallelujah, and masculinities. We, we, you know, we do, we, we think, and I sometimes still do, and I'm trying not to, as you can tell, I, I, 29 years we're not opening my mouth and now I can't shut up. So I don't know what you're doing for lunch, but it, we're in here. It's a lock-in now and we're <laughs> going to be talking all day about this stuff because I love it and it saves lives. And men don't do that. You know, if you've got an issue, well, I, I was trying to keep it in and to kind of man up, as it were, and I, I that kind of phrase, but, you know, I, I won't address it. And it's scary. And it's scary to actually, you know, I had an issue with my wife, you know, she, she I wasn't, she, she went out with a few mates on Friday night and 
I can say no today. My, my therapist has said, if you can't say no, how can I trust your yeses? And I think that's kind of, that's really nice. So I can say no, I don't want to go out. <laughs> go out. She came back on, 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 she stayed with my pal and came back um, 11 o'clock on uh, Saturday morning. And, and because I wasn't happy with her return, <laughs> <laughs> She's had a real issue with me. I'm like, it's a little bit unfair, I think. But that's only my side of it. She's like kind of going, you know, I said, that, oh, I saw Natty and, and saw this and I saw that. And she, they send their love. And because I wasn't enthusiastic and go, oh, did they? Oh, they really? <laughs> She's got the right out with me. I think it's a bit unfair. But you're only getting my version of this, by the way, as well. <laughs> so I've got the ability. What I used to do is just keep all that stuff in. You know, because it's kind of safer. I don't want to talk to her about it, whether it's unfair or not unfair and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and maybe, maybe I need to say to her, look, I, I don't think you're right there. I, I think that's a little bit unfair, you know. You know, if I'm going to shout through the rooftops every time you come home from going, and, going out with a mate, I, I'm sorry that I wasn't... Because I can say sorry today as well, you know. And I can say I, I don't know, you know, as well. Which is, because I was the biggest no in the world. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, and all that. And that keeps you stuck. So I can say to her, I'm really sorry. You know, but it takes me a couple of days to process it. You know, and I still kind of, at times, don't want the conflict. or don't. It's all fear. It's all fear-based. It's all fear-based. I don't want to do it. I don't want to open my mouth. I don't want to be vulnerable. Because what might happen? She might leave me. All that kind of stuff. And my experience tells me, once I do get it out and you're honest and you're open with people, you get it back. You get honesty and you get openness back. You really do. It might not be the answer that you want, but I can handle it. You know, I can handle it today. Emotion. Basically, it's growing up emotionally, you know, and I never did that. I never did that. You know, I was a 29-year-old man in a 15-year-old body. I was so emotionally, um, I don't think we can say it today, but... Uh, emotionally broken. Mm. I don't. I, it's got to be got to be fixed to be broken. But um, you've yeah. got a great. I was listening to a podcast just this morning. You've got a great acronym for fear. Oh, face everything and recover. Yeah. Yeah. I used to fuck everything and run. Can you say that? Yeah. <laughs> Safe environment. Um, yeah. I used to just run for the hills with with fear comes along. Good. Couldn't couldn't talk to people and and couldn't do this and. I, I just wasn't at peace with myself, I suppose, you know, and, and okay with me, you know. I'm okay with me today, you know. I've still got the same broken nose and I've still got the same big ears and I'm still six foot three. But I'm kind of okay and that's been, a, that's been 25 years in the making, really, because before, you know, the suppression, that's what I did, suppressed it in alcohol and, and everything, really, in running. You know, you run around the road, you... you, you you don't think, you don't, you know, it's gone, you know. People, you know, you kick a ball about, it, it's gone. You don't have to worry about stuff. But then when you can't kick the ball for 24 hours a day, you've know, you got to face this stuff and you've got to talk to people. And that just frightened the life out of me. But I've, I've kind of turned it on its head now and I, and I fall front ahead. And if I have any fear, I, you know, for me, you're either in faith or you're in fear, to be honest with you. And uh, I've got a bit of faith in my life today as well, so... One last question. Oh, it's going to be for me. So you mentioned earlier, you got the hump that... Uh, it's a, tra it's a tra statue. Tra yeah, you mentioned earlier that I didn't mention the statue. So um, Highbury sends you home. Mm. But uh, there's, there's a bronze Tony outside the Emirates, I believe. I think it's the first statue that, that was put on there. Because there's Henri and Bergkamp now, but I think, I think you were the first. Um, I, I can't remember, I can't recall, but I'm not sure if there's much of a, of a, of a plaque there. I think it says Tony Adams, and that's it. I was just thinking after... Well, after I think there is a plaque there, Sasha, yeah, and it says one. from 1983 to 2002, and it felt That's, like yeah. I actually died. Yeah, yeah. But, well, that was, that was going to be my question. After, after everything you've been through... But the your career, career did die. ...in your life, um, if you could write your own plaque there for Arsenal fans, for football fans, for young men, for young women, for old men, for old women to come to, to look at that and... What would you want it to say now, today? Well, I think I, I got sober for a reason. A really dear friend of mine says, um, I wasn't saved from the sea to be kicked to death on the shore. You know, and I think there was a reason why, I don't know what it is, I don't know, guys, but there was something going, 
you're not going to die today. <laughs> you know, you need to do something. You need to go and play football again at the highest level and win trophies and just kind of... I think that was one of the reasons. And then my charity about helping other people, I don't think you can beat that. Whatever I did in my football career, I, I just don't... When you help another human being to save their life, then that's, that's, that's the tops for me. Yeah, so I think everything's in in order for a reason. I wish I knew that at the start. <laughs> I might have had a better, easier ride, but uh, um, I've had to live through it. But I do think that there's a, there's a purpose, uh, maybe a higher purpose here, and I don't want to get all religious. I'm certainly not religious. I'm, I feel like I'm very spiritual, but um, I there's, a, there's, a, there's a coincidence in many situations when I... When I went through and I crashed my car, I did 80 miles an hour straight across an A road. What we got? We got the A11, then we A1. Here we go, an A1, dual carriageway, A1, straight across the A1, 80 miles an hour on a Sunday afternoon. I clipped a lamppost, ended up in someone's front door. I'd driven for seven years at that point. Uh, I passed my uh, driving, test, driving test in 83. In 1990, I had the car crash. I never wore my seatbelt. I put it on that day. Saved my life. I don't know what that's about. I don't know why that's about. I fell out of that car, got glass in my hair. It stopped me, but it, no bags in those days. You know, I, I, I could have killed everybody, you know. And the insanity, I tell you where the illness is, and it gives you an example of the illness of addiction. I do that, I go straight through, I go to prison because of that. I take my licence away for two years. I want to say weeks, I think it was days. When I got my licence back, I was drinking and driving again. You know, I was three and a half times over the legal limit when I ran straight across that line. Flip-flops and a Bermuda trousers, no top, straight across, shit-faced. Three and a half times, four times over the legal limit. Got my licence back. Within days, within days, I'm getting shit-faced and getting in that car again. That, my friends, is insanity. That is insanity. I don't do that today. And what do I want on that crest? I think it, it sums up my Arsenal <coughs> career. I'm very honoured. But I think it's for a reason. And I said... Jokingly at the start, I don't think you get a statue if you stay shit-faced. You know, I don't think I don't think you do. Um, so that's what that that statue's for. It's to remind everybody. And when I wheeled out, it was an orgasmic moment. You know, it was an euphoria. I smashed the goal in against Everton in '98, and we won the league. And I smashed it with my left foot, and I couldn't kick it with my left foot when I was 12. So there's a there's an example of practice for you. Practice, practice, practice. And it's like emotional and it's about you know, mental stuff. It, it's about practice. We have to work on it, you know. To be, to be better at anything, you have to work at it. But I think that's, that's what the statue's about. The statue's about honouring a man that, that, uh, um, that got clean and sober and, uh, and, 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 yeah, and survived to tell the tale. Thank you so much for, for coming to us today and, and sharing your tale. Uh, it's been a fantastic, fantastic afternoon. Uh, great questions our audience as well, and it's been really appreciated. So, big round of applause, please, Mr Tony Adams.